Here. Powers? Clark? Stamel? Here. Kennedy? Here. Oberacker? Here. Bliss? Here. Marietta? Here. McCarty? Here. Wilbur? Here. Kotnick? Here. <clears throat> Gelsman? Here. Parson? Here. Still gross. Rest of the floor, please state your name and address and name the back of the room. The final comments for three minutes. Hello, I'm Antoinette Kuzminski. I would like to add another piece of information to the debate that we've heard here before about the counties contributing to New York State's Medicaid program. This debate, I hope, assumes that Medicaid is a service which we need and we all wish to preserve for our county's residents. This debate is really about who should pay for it. What would happen if the counties successfully resist the current required contribution to Medicaid, which is capped for Otsego County at $10.5 million? Of course, the state might assume the burden, probably through increased income taxes or other more punitive measures, but no one really knows how or even if that gap would be filled. So my question is this, how much money is really at stake here? How many dollars actually come back to the county's economy for every dollar that we spend on Medicaid? The fact is this figure is unknown, but a fairly accurate estimate can be made. The last year that we have information for is 2007, when the state spent $70 million in Otsego County to pay for Medicaid services. At that time, the state's total Medicaid budget was $40 billion. Last year, the state's total Medicaid budget was $65 billion. If you do the math, you can readily extrapolate that last year at least $100 million came back to Otsego County's health care, institutional care, and other Medicare, Medicaid-supported institutions. These are employers. This is our economy. This is the lifeblood of our economy. Setting aside entirely the welfare of the recipients of the services which were provided, what happens to our already fragile economy when $100 million goes missing? And how many other investments have you ever made where you got back orders of magnitude? For a, a, a $10 million investment, you get back $90 million. So before advocating a penny-wise and pound-foolish approach to our property taxes, the county board needs to consider the potential economic impact of messing with Medicaid and the institutions it supports. Thank you. I'd like this to be in the record. Anybody else wishing to speak? Good morning. Thank you. I'm Pat McBrady. I'm from Hartwick. I'd like to speak in opposition to the idea that the County should fund either the subplant animal shelter or create a position within the sheriff's department or any other department for an animal cruelty officer. Um, I've been on, I was on the board of the SPCA when it was the SSPCA. I did two terms as president. Um, I have never bought a dog in my life. They come to me naturally. The idea of funding by any government agency for something of this nature, it seems just poor priorities, is the only way I can put it. And that's one thing. The other thing is I have found over the years in involvement in other groups that if you, if people come to believe that, peop, uh, that organizations are receiving government funding, they tend to be less generous. We are very fortunate in this community in that we have both philanthropists of substantial means and the general public who support in amazing fashion the SAS. Um, I have a letter I wrote to Representative Ellis and you all have a copy which details my objections. On the other side, uh, an animal cruelty officer sounds like an excellent idea. Right now you have in my own estimation, 8 to 15 animal cruelty officers. They're the state police and the sheriff's deputies. They go to a scene, they see something, and they react at the moment. Calling the SAS, getting people out to take care of the animals, whether they're there to see something, 
or to arrest someone and the animals seem to be in jeopardy or in need of a home. And these guys are good. Um, we had a case a while back where our total commitment was sixty eight thousand dollars we spent taking care of dogs. We went to court to recover that money and were successful in large part because of the testimony of several state troopers and the actions of our own DA, Mr. Mule. So I don't see the need for this and I would very much fear that if you had an officer dedicated to this, the sergeants, the bureaucracy would say to a trooper or to a deputy, pass it off. Give it to the animal cruelty officer. It's such as human nature. Again, I've got a letter there. I would ask you to read it and consider it, but I would come out in opposition to either of those ideas. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. Thank you. Leslie Burley at Middlefield. Um, I want to circle back again to this idea of uh, a resolution in support of the Faso Collins Amendment. I was at John Faso's town hall on Thursday, and even he says the HCA is done, not happening. And by extension, that amendment is not happening. That amendment was ill-advised to begin with, but if this board were serious about wanting to reduce the Medicaid burden in counties, you would be looking at single-payer health care in New York State, which is just one vote away from passing. So it doesn't feel genuine to me that this is actually to do the business of the county. The second thing I want to say in that, and I missed the end of that meeting, but I did read that one of the representatives said he didn't understand why the resolution was pulled because of 20 people at the back of the room. These are your constituents. These are voters and these are taxpayers. If you think that you shouldn't have to change something because of what the voters the constituents and the taxpayers have to say, it's time to step down. Anyone else wish to speak? Yes? Oh. Maria? Oh, ah. okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Maria Agello. Well, we do have quite a crowd here today. I'm afraid I'm going to go way off the beaten path and become a little bit self centered. I'm here once again to talk about an ethics board. Mr. Bliss, Mr. Bliss, thank you, thank you for having the guts and the courage to stand up to start the process of an ethics committee. Now I know there are other gentlemen here and ladies that would follow in suit. It just takes one to start, doesn't it? Just one. Have the guts to impanel this board and have a review of the ethics in this county. I am putting it in the record that I want my, my issue at 104 Filburn Road, Richfield Springs, New York, the sale and transfer of that property to another employee while I was still waiting to go to court. That's one issue. The second issue, of course, is I, I don't understand all the all the things with the animals and everything, but it wouldn't hurt to throw a couple dollars. We are generous in this community. We are. But several years ago, there was a resolution that the, that the legislators did give the um, animal shelter $5,000 a year. So in all our generosity, times are hard for all of us. We have relatives and other people that are in horrible danger right now. Hurricane Harvey, now Hurricane Irma. So we would like to, to, in prayer, keep them safe, Lord. That we in this county, who are right now blessed with just a little bit of rain, may be able to have resources sent to them. And also for our animals, our horses, our cows. We don't know what's going to happen. We're a farming community. We flood with a little bit of rain anyway. So have, have compassion. Have that ethics board, Mr. Bliss. You started, I'll be there. I'll be the first one. And as always, God bless you in your endeavors. Keep us in mind, all of us, all of us. Whatever, whatever our issues are, remember, you're the ones we come to. 
You are the legislative board. You make the laws. Whatever you say is legal is. God bless. Have a great day. And be safe in this weather. Thank you. I have to go back. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, my name is Edward Doorhead. I live in the hamlet of Walcombe in the town of New Lisbon. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, well, I always notice things when I travel around a little bit. I had an opportunity a couple of weeks back uh, to go down to Kentucky, visit my cousin and her husband. They're just outside of Louisville. Uh, beautiful house there. She's an interior designer. Uh, so needless to say, you know, four bedroom house, a uh, huge house, three garages. It's about a 250 to 300 foot concrete driveway leading up to the house, circular in front, and then going down to the garages and everything there. It heated in the ground pool, the whole nine yards, gazebo out there, everything. Uh, six and three quarter acres, I believe they told me. So now what, what do you think something like that would appraise for or whatever? We got talking about taxes the one evening. That leads me into the rest of this. We're talking about taxes. They're both, uh, well, she keeps up with the business a bit, you know, through the continuing college credits. But uh, we got talking about it. They were complaining about their taxes because uh, he's retired. They're both in their mid 70s. And it uh, turned out the taxes combined school, property, the uh, city of Goshen, and everything there where they're located. Uh, it was a, a little north of uh, 4,000, I believe 42 something or whatever. And I says, you know, what's wrong with this picture? I'm thinking. And when I told him what my taxes were, yeah, I have 108 acres, mostly woods and everything. Uh, yeah, I have a house, it's worth, you know, property and everything. Probably not even a quarter. Possibly, maybe give it its leeway, a third of the value with their place. And when I told them I'm north to 8,000, they couldn't believe it. They were totally shocked. I, you know, what's wrong with the picture altogether? That's why I would say one thing we ought to be doing is all the counties get together, support Faso and Collins in their endeavor, because guess what? Let the governor put the taxes where they should be throughout the state on everybody. He wants to be the big guy. He wants to have his aspirations. He keeps saying that he's going to go for governor in 2018. Yes, he's going to do that. Let him write something down in writing, have a lawyer draw it up, that he'll see his governorship through completely. He has aspirations for president. He could give a hoot less about governor, plain and simple. You know, got to wake up to these facts and, uh, you know, come to the reality. Why are people losing their houses here so much? Both with the, uh, you know, uh, through the uh, tax sales, through uh, foreclosures and everything. It's taxes. There's no, uh, no getting away from it. Look at, uh, everybody's afraid to make that first move. What happened in California years ago with Proposition 13? The governor and everybody else, oh, oh there's not going to be any services. Everything's going to be bankrupt. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. How are they doing today? You know? That's an example of where things go. Uh, the words I'd like to leave you with that I came up with, uh, you know, just my common sense, make a decision, be it right or wrong, but be decisive. Life's road is painted with flat squirrels that couldn't make a decision. Think about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak? I'm Russell Ahrens. Um, Maria Jello resides with me. Here's Bob Force's shirt. Bob Force, don't forget this guy. I think this county is going to remember him in court. He wants a day in court. He wants a fair day in court. He didn't have that. Unfortunately, and I'm glad Mrs. Kakoma isn't here, but it's a huge conflict of interest to have her in front of Judge Burns making decisions and having Judge Burns make decisions based upon her as the countering attorney. Judge Burns owes his job to, Michael, to Judge Michael Kakoma. So, I mean, it's quite evident that nobody's going to get a fair shake here. Now, there's a board member no longer here that was opposed to her appointment, and that was Betty Ann Schwerd. 
And I think your chairperson, you know that she was opposed, but she probably went along to go along. Each one of you board members have a responsibility to your conscience and to our God that we would do the right things. And ethics is huge. Now Maria's home was taken. It was sold to another employee who, this is her fourth rental house that she has. That's a business. Mrs. Mrs. McGovern, your husband is involved in a business. You made full disclosure, rightfully so, that this could possibly be a conflict. But because you did that, it's the right thing to do. And I'll tell you, we're very thankful we have somebody that's still wrenching on our beat-up equipment here. Talking about beat-up, this whole county has got real problems. I mean, everything seems to be falling apart. I had no idea that the highway department garage is condemned. All the trucks are sitting outside. Those trucks are aged. They need a lot of work. Those guys can't possibly keep up with what's coming on. I mean, I was stranded out on the road myself recently. Thankfully, we got some cell service and was rescued. But, I mean, it's, it's not the way to be doing this county. So, Len Carson, I recently met your neighbor at the REA. I was amazed, and I'm kind of just jump around, this is more Ed's thing, how little REA service we have in New York State, and that we're blessed in that we have water power, so we have somewhat affordable electricity here. When you look at the entire United States, it's amazing how much of it is served by REA. Now, at a recent meeting, those people in the REA, they don't get in on the, you know, the awards, you know, the, the gift prizes and stuff. So why are we doing this with our county employees? I didn't see any of you employees at the auction. I bought a tiny piece this year. I would have liked to have seen you there. And it used to be, you used to approve the properties. So that if there was some kind of a conflict of me buying that, then it could be pulled out. But now it just seems that we jump over everything and it's, it seems to be like a national problem in this too. Everybody just does what they want, get away with it, tailgate your neighbor, speed everywhere, and then cry when it happens. Well, you know, this country right now is coming down to its knees. I'm not sure why this is happening other than eh, just the way it is. But when this next storm wallops us, we're going to all be looking at whatever happened here. Please return Maria Agello's home and land. It's the one right thing you can do during your time here. Everything that we've seen to have done doesn't seem to be working too well, combining with Onondaga. Um, the IDA, Otsego now has become Otsego then. So where are we going with this? Please do the right thing. Bob Forrest, don't forget him. In the year that this went on, you had to go back and correct your mistakes. And you know what it was, it's public. But you sold land in Delaware County. You, you had Kevin Ho, you gave him his property back. You had Chuck Barringer, you took away property he bought and gave it to somebody that bought that owned it 10 years before. So there were a lot of mistakes that year. And Bob Force's place and Maria's was a mistake too. And for you to just one day flip it like that was amazing. I bought this piece of property. I had the new tax bill in my hand before I even I had the title to the property. So, I mean, you're not wasting any time in this. I thank you for your time today. Be well. Uh, I'm Greg Klein, uh, Village of Cooperstown. I want to say off the, on the record that I'm speaking not as a crier editor or Daily Star reporter, but as an actor and a film buff, want to be a filmmaker. I, I just wanted to rebut something that Ed said last month. And Ed, I know it was an offhanded comment when you were talking about something you were passionate about, but you said that you had to read in the Daily Star that money was going from the state to Hollywood. And that's not the way the tax credits work for the film business. And I just wanted to explain it a little bit. Um, something you'll hear me say a lot is that we are literally the only part of the state not taking advantage of the film business in New York State right now. Not taking advantage of the tax credit. We have no film office. We have very little infrastructure. And it could all be built here pretty easily, I think. Um, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a lawyer. If I was advising somebody on doing a film in upstate New York, I would say talk to your film accountant, talk to your film lawyer. Um, but a couple of things about the tax credit. One, the state is putting money into upstate film. And as I said, just about every other part of the state now has a film office, now is having five, six, ten films a year filmed in their area. I believe in 2016 we had one day of filming in this area. It was an Oneonta for a commercial. A friend of mine's daughter was in it. 
they called the Albany Film Office to set it up because we have no film office in this region. So the people from Albany got a, you know, a paycheck or a credit or you know, however it works with the film office to come in here and set it up. Now the way that people do tax credits these days in the film business, you basically don't make a film without getting a tax credit. I was living in LA at the time when they had what was called film flight. And basically places like Vancouver or Atlanta, Georgia or you know, New Orleans, Louisiana were offering tax credits and they drew people's film in. Now when you say that the money goes to Hollywood, Ed, really it doesn't because people use these tax credits ahead of time as part of their financing plan. So the money goes back to a bank essentially, or the money goes back to the investor who put the money in in the first place. They do it in a very smart way so that you pay for, you credit what's called below the line cost. That's your accountant, your lawyer, your electricians, your contractors, your carpenters, your everything you would hire locally, your caterer, your, you know, all your local spend, housing, office space. What you don't credit is Michael Bay's $10 million contract as a director or Jennifer Lawrence's $10 million contract as an actor. So the state is setting it up and New York is very smart about how they do it so that they're really paying part of what a producer pays to film here in upstate. So, um, you know, there's a lot of permutations to it. There's an infrastructure credit. So if the Hall of Fame built a film studio here, the state might pick up part of that as well, for instance. Or if we built a film studio here, the state might pick up part of the infrastructure here. Um, but I just don't want you guys to close your minds to it. Um, we need a film office and we need some infrastructure here. Ulster County, I read, in the first part of 2017 had five films filmed there with a $5 million local spend. So again, that's not for the actors, that's not for the director, that's how much they paid to rent houses, to hire carpenters, to hire electricians, to hire you know, the teenager as a PA. Um, and it's something that everybody else is taking advantage of except for Central New York. I don't know who does it, whether it's a county thing, a Cooperstown thing, we've got to get a film office set up here so that they don't go someplace like Albany or Syracuse to, to film. We have a lot of resources, as Kathy says, we have a lot of undeveloped highway. Um, you know, if you put a film office, say it was the Cooperstown Film Office, you might not find the space in Cooperstown, so where does it go? It goes to Middlefield, or Mount Vision, or Hartwick, or, you know, Lawrence, someplace close by, someplace that might need other developments, such as cell phone service, or, you know, internet service, which certainly if you had a film studio here, I think they'd want to make sure that got set up. Um, so again, I mean, I could talk about this all day, I won't. I'll let you guys get to your business, but please keep an open mind and Ed, don't take it personally. I just wanted you guys to know that that could be money that the state pays to our region rather than all the money that we send to the state. Thank you. Thank you. Else you um, hello everyone. I'm Nicole Dillingham from Springfield Center. I just want to respond briefly to the comments from uh, the gentleman from Hartwick about the Susquehanna Animal Shelter. Just to clarify, I appreciate that he has served as a volunteer there and maybe even served as president, although I don't recall exactly when that was. Times have changed since then, and he is right that our community is generous, but the animal shelter is losing $90,000 a year due to flooding, additional staff due to extraordinary numbers of animals being brought in, the fact that it is the only licensed animal shelter in the entire county <coughs> And this county needs to recognize that this shelter is providing government services. If someone is arrested with animals in the home, they are brought by the sheriffs to the shelter. If someone is accused of animal abuse, those animals, while those charges are pending, are initially brought to the animal shelter. And we provide a very important service to your constituents, to the people who sometimes can't afford to care for their animal, people who are sick and can't care for an animal, people who pass away, people who have to move. They bring their animals to the shelter. We take them. We have a surrender fee, but often the surrender fee isn't even paid and we will still take the animal. So we are $90,000 per year right now um, operating out of endowment funds, which will last 10 to 12 years. Um, our community is generous, but we can't, through just donations, support the operation of this very important facility for the entire county. So I know that we have asked before, but I know you're in your budget process, please include a generous grant to the animal shelter this year in this year's budget. Thank you very much. <laughs>